One thing about the Harlem Renaissance that often gets left out of the history books is that it was very queer. But don't take my word for it. As Henry Louis Gates Jr. put it in the 1993 essay, The Black Man's Burden, the Harlem Renaissance was surely as gay as it was black. The roll call of literary, artistic, and musical figures from the Harlem Renaissance who were more or less openly gay, bisexual, or sexually ambiguous is a long and hollow one. Langston Hughes, Alice Dunbar Nelson, Angelina Welt Grimke, County Cullen, Claude McKay, Wallace Sermon, Alan Locke, Bessie Smith, Ethel Waters, Moms Mabley, and Ma Rainey. And I might be leaving a few out. Indeed, in Harlem, to even be in the famous crew of the socialite Alila Walker, you had to be tolerant of bisexuality and homosexuality. Especially because Walker was known for her huge parties where people of different genders, races, and classes mingled, and where the marriages of lesbian women were celebrated. Why the Harlem Renaissance was so queer is something of a mystery, as is usually the case when we're talking about times and places when LGBT luminaries seem to magically congregate. A clue might lie in the forces that made the appearance of so many influential black artists in Harlem in the 1920s and 1930s possible in the first place. In the southern United States, the Reconstruction following the American Civil War led to African Americans being elected to local and state offices. Less than a decade after slavery was abolished in the United States, an ex-slave was elected to represent South Carolina in the House of Representatives, with over 1,500 blacks being elected to local, state, and national offices. This flow of progress was cut off with the passing of the oppressive Jim Crow laws and the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. Meanwhile, in the islands of the Caribbean still controlled by the British Empire, blacks were disillusioned with the discrimination and oppression they experienced under British rule, in spite of British rhetoric about personal liberty. This especially came to a head when black soldiers volunteered to fight in World War I, only to still endure official discrimination, and not even be sent to fight in Europe alongside white British soldiers. These forces coincided to create a mass black exodus to the northern United States. As people who can afford the cost of packing up their lives and moving far away tend to be, these migrants from both the Caribbean and the southern United States were mostly from middle class backgrounds, well educated, and were more politically assertive and radical. This was the fuel for the Harlem Renaissance. So what does being gay have to do with all that? Well, you know, maybe it wasn't so much that many of the stars of the Harlem Renaissance just happened to be queer, but that they, because of their backgrounds, understandably felt more free to put their true selves forward and experiment with their identities. Except that doesn't quite fit the background of today's subject, Gladys Bentley. So, maybe we can call her the exception that proves the rule. Her mother Mary was indeed from the Caribbean, Trinidad specifically, although the reasons why she emigrated are somewhat lost to history. Anyway, Gladys was born in the northern metropolis of Philadelphia, but her background was solidly working class. According to Gladys herself, she was bullied by other children because she was overweight and masculine. Even her own mother was cold to her because Gladys believed she wanted a son, not a daughter. Girls were more trouble than they were worth, at least according to Mary Bentley. Much later in life, Gladys Bentley would reflect, It seems I was born different. At least, I always thought so. From the time I can remember anything, even when I was toddling, I never wanted a man to touch me. Soon, I began to feel more comfortable in boys' clothes than in dresses. Late in life, Bentley would recall when her feelings of attraction to women began, even if she didn't realize their importance at the time. Writing about her elementary school teacher, Bentley writes, 
In class, I sat for hours watching her and wondering why I was so attracted to her. At night, I dreamed of her. I didn't understand the meaning of these dreams until later. Unfortunately, her mother seems to have glimpsed something that troubled her about her daughter. Her mother took her to various doctors. Gladys would claim that her mother and father meant well, but they just didn't know how to cope with the situation, which to them was both startling and disgraceful. Like so many gay performers throughout history, Gladys took what made her feel alienated and created a powerful persona out of it. She unabashedly made herself a bull dagger, 1920s American slang for a butch lesbian. Of course, it helped that she ended up in New York City. Over the course of the gay 20s, sorry, couldn't resist that pun, the first gay and lesbian bars were emerging in America's biggest urban centers, and certain neighborhoods became havens for people open about their love for the same sex. In New York's South Village, a Polish Jewish lesbian immigre, Eva Kochever, opened Eve Adams Tea Room in 1925. A sign on the front door read, Men are admitted, but not welcome. Convicted of disorderly conduct and obscenity, she was deported to Europe, where she would go on to fight in the Spanish Civil War, and sadly later became a victim of the Holocaust. But that's another story. While Eva Kochever was far from the only owner of a gay bar to suffer persecution, underground speakeasies catering to lesbians and gay men spread. Gladys perfected her act at one of them, the Clan House, an underground speakeasy that catered to both Harlem's best and brightest, and the Manhattan elite, and which catered to a loyal clientele of gay men. Gladys had an amazing knack for making up blues lyrics to tunes from the popular songs of the day on the spot, and a powerful, distinctive voice. But what really caught audience members' attention was how Gladys loved to perform her acts in a suit and a top hat. This was only natural, since she often dressed in drag in public. In her essay, How Does the Bull Dagger Get Out of the Footnote, or Gladys Bentley's Blues, Regina V. Jones even theorized that Gladys influenced the male drag in Marlene Dietrich and Josephine Baker's acts, although Regina admits it's impossible to prove one way or the other. But that wasn't the only transgressive part of the act. Gladys would sometimes perform accompanied by backup singers who were men in drag. Her songs were sometimes lewd and risque parodies of classic blues songs and popular show tunes and original tunes, some of which spelled out her lesbianism, which, naturally, she did not release on her records. Fearlessly, she flirted openly with women in the audience. There were her critics, of course. On April 7, 1934, the newspaper The Chicago Defender called her the masculine garbed, smut-singing entertainer. Still, her popularity and her acceptance in the world of the glitterati spoke for itself. Besides Harlem Renaissance illuminaries like Langston Hughes, her audiences included Cary Grant, Francis E. Williams, Mary Astor, Bruce Cabot, J.P. Morgan, and even the future King George VI of Britain. Off the stage, Gladys walked around New York in men's clothes, arm in arm with her girlfriends. She even claimed she married a white woman in Atlantic City in a public ceremony. However, the identity of the woman, if she actually existed, has never been uncovered. While Gladys enjoyed success both as a performer and by selling records nationally, she eventually did leave New York City as the Harlem Renaissance waned. She went all the way across the country to Los Angeles, where she moved in with her mother. She continued her act at a number of nightclubs with gay clientels across Southern California, including Mona's, the United States' first openly lesbian nightclub. Unfortunately, Gladys would not be spared the chill of the new more reactionary era following World War II. By the end of the 1940s, Gladys had to request a special permit to be able to perform in drag. Before too long, she had to perform in women's clothing or risk getting arrested, or her venues shut down. 
the U.S. House Committee on Un-American Activities, which always gleefully associated homosexuality with the specter of communism, even investigated Gladys as a suspected communist. Why? Just because of reports that she was in a same-sex marriage. Times were certainly changing from the more permissive 1920s and 1930s, and unfortunately Gladys clearly felt she had to change with them. After all, her mother was ailing and depended entirely on her income. So, Gladys only dressed in women's clothing and cleaned up her lyrics. She even took an extreme and very public step. In the August 1952 issue of the African-American magazine Ebony, an article penned by Gladys titled, I'm a Woman Again, was published. In it, she claimed she had been cured of her homosexuality by taking estrogen, and had entered into a happy heterosexual marriage. Yet she also spoke frankly about the tremendous loneliness and persecution she suffered as a result of being gay. Our number is legion, and our heartbreak inconceivable, Gladys writes. Society shuns us, the unscrupulous exploit us, very few people can understand us. Indeed, even though Gladys described being a lesbian as a hell as terrible as dope addiction, and claimed, I cannot but vehemently condemn and denounce those who defend deviation, a first part of the article is an eloquent plea for acceptance and empathy. In fact, Regina V. Jones and others have argued that I'm a woman again, rather than being an act of penance, was Gladys just playing another role. As Regina puts it, the only thing she doesn't do is wink at the reader. I personally tend to agree, not least because the man she claimed to have married, theater critic J.T. Gibson, said he never actually married her. Curiously, though, the same year the article in Ebony was published, she did marry a man, a 28-year-old cook named Charles Roberts. They divorced before too long. The motives behind the marriage and the divorce, like a lot of Gladys Bentley's life, remain a mystery. What is more is that Gladys Bentley was hardly cured of her lesbianism. A columnist visiting Gladys for an interview remarked on two pictures she had. She casually replied, Oh, that's my husband, and that's my wife. Her public maneuvers, however sincere or unsincere they were, saved her career from even the gender-enforcing 1950s. In 1955, she was even a guest on one of the hit game shows of the era, You Bet Your Life, hosted by Groucho Marx. Yet, she still was ready to embark on a shocking career change, becoming a minister. She joined a new Los Angeles church called the Temple of Love in Christ Incorporated, first as a member of their choir, but then started studying to become a minister with them. Sadly though, before she could finish her studies, she died from pneumonia at the age of 52 in January of 1960. She would not live to see the pendulum swing back again toward greater personal freedom for people like her. But nonetheless, she still left behind a powerful example for anyone who feels the need to fearlessly reinvent themselves, in private or in public. Nobody else.